Heavenly Father, we come again to depend on you, Lord. You call us to uh, enter your kingdom uh, as a little child. You call us to depend on you as our Father for everything. And so we come to depend on you for understanding of your word. Thank you for giving it. Lord, please help us to understand it. May we not rely on past understanding, Lord, uh, or on our fleshly interpretation. Please give us your, uh, your wisdom, Lord, for each one of us, Lord. And apply this to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the past few talks from 2 Corinthians in our series, I've been talking about giving. I don't plan to particularly recap on it because I think the same principles came up again and again in those few talks. But that was what we were looking at last time, two whole chapters on giving. And now we come to really quite a significant change in the letter because for the remaining few chapters of this letter in 2 Corinthians, Paul is really, uh, in a lot of ways, mounting a defence. Uh, some have even suggested that the remaining chapters were actually a different letter. Uh, but uh, I don't go along with that, and that traditionally it's seen as all one letter, and there's, there are various things that link the two together. But there is a shift where Paul had made certain defences before. He particularly focused on it now. Perhaps uh, in the, uh, as the climax of the letter to really bring home some points that he wanted to leave with them. Uh, mainly, or partly related at least, to the fact that he was going to be coming to them. And that comes up in our passage this morning. Uh, so let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to focus on the first six verses this morning, but we'll carry on a bit further. Now I, Paul, myself, urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ... I, who am meek when face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent. I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some, who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful, for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. You are looking at things as they are outwardly. If anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ's, let him consider this again within himself, that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. For even if I boast somewhat further about our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be put to shame. For I do not wish to seem as if I would terrify you by my letters. For they say, his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters when absent, such persons we are also indeed when present. <clears throat> so in verses 1 to 6, which we're mainly considering this morning, there are two contrasts. There's a contrast between speaking or acting in meekness and gentleness, uh, versus acting in boldness and confidence, even mentioning something of punishment. The two contrasts uh, there. And another one is between the flesh and the spirit. The ways of the world, or of our human ways of thinking and acting, and the spiritual ways that we're called to live in instead, once we become believers. And we also see that it talks about the weapons of our warfare. So we're going to take up all three of these things this morning. Firstly, looking at this idea of being gentle, or meek, versus the idea of being bold. In verse 1, uh, he says, he, well, he uses this description of being meek when face to face, but bold when absent. Now, Paul had been in Corinth, he had founded the church there, and he's clearly talking about the time when he's visited there. In this letter, he talks about coming to them for the third time. So he's made two visits uh, that he has described, and in that time, he says that he's been meek, but he talks about being bold towards them when absent being bold in the way he wrote these letters. 
Now, I wonder if he's describing more what the, his opponents were saying here. Because we just read in verse 9, verse 10, they, this unnamed group of people who were causing problems in the church, they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. Maybe Paul was quiet speaking naturally. Maybe he was somebody of small stature. Uh, humanly speaking, obviously we don't know for certain, but there's perhaps an indication that maybe he spoke quite quietly and gently in some way. He wasn't some bold, brash figure who thumped the pulpit, if they had pulpits in their, ch in their gatherings, possibly not. Uh, but, you know, he wasn't some firebrand preacher in, in one sense. Uh, he, amongst these believers, he was gentle with them. Uh, and so this was what his opponents were saying well, you know, he writes these great letters, but in person, he's quite a different person. And yet, as he says in verse 11, actually, it's the same character, the same actions and attitude that we will have both in letter and in person. We can be bold when present, you know, I guess is what he's saying. And yet, he would have been meek with them at first. It would have been right to have been gentle with this new church that he founded and with this uh, group of people, you know, the Bible talks about people being babes in Christ and, and needing milk and, and they would need to be treated very gently. But here when situations were creeping into the church, perhaps more than creeping in, there was going to be a need for something stronger. He was going to sh need to show not just strong words in his letters, but strong word when he came to visit them. Or he might do. Uh, and so Paul is saying there's this need, as he says in verse 2, to be bold against some. And again, these aren't named, but these people who are causing problems. And yet he says, I don't want to be bold that way towards you. He's writing to the church. He's saying, I'm going to have to be bold against some who are proclaiming wrong things, but I don't want to act that way towards you. It implies that these people were at least partly outsiders. Maybe they were coming into the church. Maybe they were influencing the church. But he's writing to the church as a whole and saying, I'm going to have to be bold against some, but may it not be against you. Nobody should desire to be uh, really uh, uh, strong and uh, provocative uh, in their uh, way of dealing with people. Sometimes it's necessary, but it shouldn't be a desire. And so he says in verse 1, I urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. This is always the best way, is to gently urge people. And he's not doing it in his own way, because he says the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And when we think of Christ, uh, think of the Lord Jesus and how he lived on earth, it was quite rare that he acted in a really uh, strong way. Yes, there were times when he cleansed the temple. Uh, he talks about him knocking the tables over. Well, I don't think he just gently kind of tilted them. You can imagine there's a power, he, he made a whip, of, you know, and, he, and he went round, powerfully cleansing the temple. He also, if we can put it this way, didn't mince his words at times with the Pharisees, with the people who were really needing to be rebuked. And yet those times were rare. Most of the time, the Lord Jesus, in his life on earth, acted with great restraint, with great gentleness. Just think... Uh, Obviously, none of us can put ourselves in the place of the Lord, but you know, imagine for a moment that you were in the Lord's place and that you had come down from the perfection of heaven and you were amongst this people who were constantly sinning, constantly doing things wrong to you, to others, by the Lord, most of all. And yet he didn't call down fire from heaven as the disciples once said that he was, you know, that maybe he should. Uh, and he didn't go around shouting all the time and telling people, you're doing wrong and you're doing wrong and you're doing wrong. He did challenge people's sin. He told the woman in adultery to go and sin no more. But he acted with such gentleness. And when reviled and, and struck and mocked and beaten in his trial, 
uh, and then crucified. Again, he was so gentle. He even prayed for those who were crucifying him. What an example the Lord Jesus gave. And so Paul is saying here, I want to follow that example. I don't want to be really uh, this really uh, strong character amongst you who's rebuking left, right and centre. I urge you by the gentleness of Christ, please take on board what I'm saying is really what he is doing here. It's interesting that in 1 Corinthians 4, if you just turn back a few pages to 1 Corinthians 4, which definitely came before 2 Corinthians, so in a previous letter, he had had to take a similar approach. 1 Corinthians 4, and the end of the chapter, uh, he says, verse 14, he's not writing these things to shame you, where he's been speaking strongly, but to admonish you as beloved children. So there's the attitude again. He's wanting to be gentle with them. But then, verse 21, he says, What do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod, or with love and a spirit of gentleness? And then he goes on to challenge the fact that somebody is within the church, committing incest, and the church has become arrogant rather than dealing with the problem. There was a need for judgment. There was a need to be strong. The church wasn't showing it. And so Paul's saying, I may have to come with a rod. I don't think he's talking about a physical rod. But he's going to need to come and put something right here. But he says, actually, I would rather come in a spirit of gentleness. And so I hope that kind of illustrates this contrast between gentleness and boldness. Sometimes boldness is needed. Peter had to speak strongly to Ananias and Sapphira, and they actually died. Their, their sin was so great, and it needed to be made an example of. The Lord, the Lord brought an end to their lives for their sin. Timothy, in dealing with the churches, uh, in the church where he was, was encouraged a few times not to be timid. Uh, not at the same time to speak wrongly. He was told to admonish th those older as fathers. But he was told the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And so it's so important, particularly as leaders, but for all of us to hold these two things in balance and always to seek to err on the side of gentleness uh, unless there's a need for something stronger. And Paul did, as I said, uh, mention at the end of our uh, ver passage in verse 6, being ready to punish all disobedience. Don't know what exactly that disobedience was. Maybe disobedience to the truth generally. Maybe disobedience to something Paul had urged them in specifically. But he clearly expected the church as a whole to be obedient. Because he says when your obedience is complete, he was trusting that the church, or most of the church, were going to respond positively to what he was saying. But where there wasn't that... They were going to need to punish that disobedience in some way, presumably putting people out of the church, presumably something of a rebuke, but it was a last resort. So that's our first contrast this morning, gentleness versus boldness. The second one is the flesh versus the spirit. The flesh versus the spirit. What was it that this group of people, or some of them, were doing wrong? We see in verse 2, some of them regarded Paul and his companions as if they walked according to the flesh. And he says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. To be described as walking in the flesh was an anathema to Paul. Paul could never have wanted to be described in that way. Because Paul had a lot to say on this topic. On the topic of walking in the spirit rather than the flesh. Uh, just keep your finger in there, but you can turn, if you want to, to Romans 8. Probably one of the best passages on this matter. Romans 8. Always hard to read just from Romans 8, because so much comes before it. He lays such a foundation uh, beforehand. But if we read in Romans 8 from verse 4. So that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, 
but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. There's no grey area here, there are two camps, either those in the flesh or those in the spirit. And of course, for any of us, I trust all of us, who have come to know the Lord Jesus and accept him as their saviour, you are seeking to walk with the Lord, you are now of the spirit. There has been a change. Your whole outlook is different, your destination is different, but your way of living now and thinking now is different. Praise the Lord. I'm glad that we're not left in that way. Because it does say those who are in the flesh can't please God. Whereas those who have their minds set on the Spirit, it's life and peace. And yet, there is sometimes a grey area in how far we go with this. Paul says in Galatians 5 verse 25, If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. He's saying, yeah, you, you're believers, you have life now by the Spirit, but you need to walk in the Spirit, in day-to-day -day life, to choose not to go in your old ways of living and thinking, but to choose to walk in the Spirit. Actually, further down in Romans 8, uh, it says, uh, Romans 8 verse 13, If you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So as we are led by the Spirit, and as the Spirit puts his finger on things in our lives that are of the flesh, that are of our old way of thinking and acting and speaking, we're called by the Spirit to put those things to death. So while we, when we become believers, are now having life in the Spirit, we then we need to go on, day by day, walking in the Spirit which should lead increasingly to seeing more of the Lord's character in us. It's always tempting to go back to the flesh. In Philippians 3, Paul talks about how he could have confidence in his flesh. He talks about how he's Jewish, how his, his background, he was really zealous, he was well trained in everything of Jewish thinking and, and he could have been well respected for those things if he'd stayed in it. And yet he says, actually, I count all of that as loss. I put no confidence in the flesh. I count it all as loss so that I can know Christ's resurrection power. Really, Paul is acknowledging that we can sometimes put confidence in the flesh. We can, as people are accusing him here in Corinth, walk according to the flesh. And so Paul is saying, no. That is not what I'm doing. There is no way he would want to do that. And so in our passage here, he says, yes, we walk in the flesh. In other words, yes, we have human bodies. Yes, there's nothing special about us. You know, we have a nature just like any other human being in that we are, are limited, we, ha we struggle, we feel tired, you know, we have lack of energy sometimes, we're in the world, we have problems with family and problems with friends and problems with work and all the other things that any human being has. And yet, he says, we don't war according to the flesh. We don't war according to the flesh. There is a difference in how they walk. And we're going to move on, therefore, to, in a moment to how they war and to these weapons of our warfare. But it did occur to me, we have had two reminders recently uh, of these matters. In our Bible study recently, we were looking at Zechariah and that verse that says, Not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And it reminded us as individuals, it reminded us as a church, that if we want to do anything, uh, when we were praying recently about outreach, if we want to do anything to reach out to others, if we want to do anything uh, for each other here, if we want to achieve anything as a church or as individuals, it must be 
by the Spirit. It must be. Because as we were also reminded in a worship time, I think last week, it says in John, the Lord Jesus says, the flesh profits nothing. It's the Spirit who gives life. There's a verse to put on our fridge or on our notice board or whatever you might put things on. The flesh profits nothing. Not just a little bit. It's not just saying, well, you can achieve a little bit in the flesh. Nothing. And so it was quite a serious charge for Paul's opponents to suggest that he walked according to the flesh. I did wonder, why was that? Why did they say that he was walking according to the flesh? There are some potential hints in the letter. In verse 1, there's an accusation, sorry, chapter 1, there's an accusation that he was vacillating. That's a great word. He was vacillating. Um, not oscillating, which it could be confused with. Um, <laughs> vacillating in his plans to travel to them. He had said he was going to come to them, and then there was a change of plan. He was accused of changing his mind and of planning things in the flesh, and he says, no, actually, we don't do that. We're led by the Spirit. And we see that in Acts, that the Spirit sometimes said, don't go to this place. And so they didn't. But that was maybe one accusation. An accusation we're going to come on to in the coming chapters was the uh, suggestion that he was taking advantage of people uh, or that others of his companions might have done. And he says, no, we didn't take advantage of them. Uh, this idea of terrifying people with letters and overextending his authority and other things. Uh, he had to make clear that he had treated the donations in a right way. He wanted to avoid any accusations. There's various things they could have said, various things they could have been thinking of, but he said, no, we walk according to the Spirit. But actually, he says, we war not according to the flesh. So let's come on finally now to the weapons of our warfare, which is a very important thing for us to consider. He says, we war not according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Well, if we're talking about war and weapons, this clearly says that there is a battle involved. And although it's said sometimes, uh, you know, we sometimes talk about it, it's good to be reminded that we live in a battle. So easy to think that we're just dealing with the flesh. That when there's a problem in, during the week, uh, and when we see problems in our nation, that it's just the people involved. And yet, the, it's a spiritual battle that we're called into. We're not called into a walk in the park, or a picnic. Uh, that comes later, you know, in heaven, when we, we, we can uh, lay down those spiritual weapons. But for now, friends, we're in a battle. And how often we all need to be reminded of that. It wasn't just Paul who was in that. Okay, Paul was in full-time ministry. He was in prominent ministry. He was an apostle. There are lots of ways in which maybe he faced particular battles. Maybe some that we might not face. But you and I all face battles. Whether we realize they're spiritual or not, we all face challenges from our enemy. Even if it's through people or situations. Let's turn to the essential passage in Ephesians 6. It's good to have that in our minds for context as we consider these things. Ephesians chapter 6. This talks about the spiritual armour. Perhaps not to be, uh, mustn't make too much of it and uh, treat them as things to put on each day, as has been said before. Some people think that, you know, you have to put this arm on every day. Of course, it should be always on, as has been pointed out before. But in Ephesians 6 and verse 10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armour of God, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness, in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armour of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, 
and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take, up, take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And it carries on, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And it says to be on the alert. But here we have the spiritual armour. I think it's fair to say that there's a particular emphasis on defence here. A lot of this armour was defensive. And we talk, it talks about standing firm. It talks about the schemes of the devil, clearly showing the devil is on the attack. And we need to be able to defend against him. We need to be able to stand firm in that faith in what the Lord's done, in faith in his promises and in the truth. We need to stand firm in the Lord's righteousness that has been given to us when the enemy might accuse us. And the helmet of salvation and all these things and the shield of faith extinguishing the enemy's flaming arrows. There is a need to stand firm and to defend against these things. But there is also scope here to consider the attack that we can have. Because, of course, the sword of the Spirit was an offensive weapon. I suppose it could have been used defensively. It was also offensive. The Word of God. The fact that as we use the Word of God, whether in a situation where the enemy is at work or in other places, that is powerful. It says elsewhere it is sharp, two-edged sword can divide between things. It can pierce and you discern the intents. I'm really messing up. I'm mangling this scripture, aren't I? But it, it gets at the thoughts and intents of the heart. It is a powerful weapon. We need to know how to use it properly. We need to know how to handle it as the Lord's workman and workwoman. But it's, it's a weapon that can be offensive as well. And so as we come back to our passage, bearing in mind what we've just looked at, it talks about the weapons of our warfare. It says that they're the weapons not of the flesh. And it did make me wonder, what fleshly weapons can we sometimes use? When we're tempted to think and act according to the flesh, what weapons of the flesh can we use? I'll suggest some. Human thinking. The way the world thinks. It's naturally been a part of us before. It can try to raise its head again within us. And when a situation occurs where we need the Spirit's leading and the Spirit's weapons, we can sometimes treat it in a fleshly way and think just like any um, Tom, Dick or Harry, shall we put it that way, uh, would think about it. Uh, the world's strategies. Sometimes in the church you come across business strategies being used and Okay, maybe there's occasionally things we can learn from the way that the businesses operate, but there's a danger that we can act the way businesses do. We, you know, there's nothing wrong with a mission statement and with a, a director of this and that and the other, in a sense, but we need to be careful that we're not thinking and acting in the flesh, but that we're thinking and acting in the spirit. Also, the way that we can sometimes get into arguments and we end up in this heated fleshly argument about things and, and argument about topics that the Lord doesn't want us to get into. Paul actually told uh, Timothy or Titus or both, you know, to avoid fleshly arguments or to avoid uh, things that are foolish. Don't get into those. There's various ways we can end up using weapons of the flesh. But actually, if we use the weapons that have been given us, it says they are divinely powerful. Isn't that great, friends, that we have divinely powerful weapons? God has not called us to be part of a spiritual battle and deal with it with fleshly weapons. He's given us what we need that are powerful. He's not left us unequipped. He's not left us poorly equipped. It says elsewhere that the man of God can be fully equipped. And Peter tells us that we have been given, through the knowledge of the Lord and his promises, everything pertaining to life and godliness. Whatever the situation is that you are facing right now, or that you might be about to, 
whatever the problem you might face, whatever attacks of the enemy, or whatever ways you're called to act, you don't need to face them with fleshly weapons or fleshly thinking. We have the spirit to lead us, and we have the spiritual, divinely powerful weapons that we need. Of course, it does beg the question, therefore, what are these weapons? The most obvious we've already talked about in Ephesians 6, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. But it says weapons, the weapons of our warfare. And it's not the only time he uses the plural, because a few chapters earlier, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 7, in that long list of ways in which they um, commended themselves in the way they acted as servants of God, one way they commended themselves was in the use of the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left. Of course, Roman soldiers would have been everywhere in those days, and Roman soldiers had more than one weapon. They would have had different weapons for different hands, for different situations. Yeah, they might have had that sword of the Spirit, but they were up. Well, the Romans didn't have those, of course. They weren't that lucky. They didn't have such a powerful weapon as the sword of the spirit. But they would have had, you know, different types of swords. They had, they had the spears or javelins and maybe other weapons as well. They were different weapons for different situations. And so I think that Paul, whatever he had in mind, would have been thinking of more than just the sword of the spirit. Of course, it being the most important weapon. It did make me wonder, therefore, what other things has God equipped us with for the spiritual battles that we face. Well, another important thing the Lord has equipped us with is the Spirit. Not just with the sword of the Spirit, but the Spirit himself to lead us, to guide us. So that in every situation, he can prompt us and say, actually, don't think about this in the flesh. Think about it this way. He can reveal things to us. He can lead us to say, well, your flesh wants to react like this to how you've just been treated or spoken to. But actually... Here's how you should act. Your flesh looks at this situation in the government and looks at Boris Johnson or Keir Starmer or this minister or this pressure group. But actually, this is what's actually going on behind the scenes. This is how the forces of darkness are working. So we have the Holy Spirit to lead us. Also to give us boldness, of course, as the apostles showed uh, when they were filled with the Spirit at Pentecost. Yeah, their flesh hadn't changed. They were still those uh, weak people who had hidden, who had locked themselves in after Jesus' death. But now they had the Spirit's power, and they went forth. Also, related to that, the Spirit gives gifts and miracles that can be used and that can speak and work powerfully. You know, Jesus at the well, he could have talked in a fleshly way to the woman uh, who came there. But he had that word of knowledge to speak into a situation and say, actually, this man you're with now, he's not your husband, and you've had all these husbands before. Wow, that spoke to her. It challenged her. And she later went to people and said, come see a man who told me all I ever did. Well, I don't think he did. I don't think he'd had that much time, especially as he was hungry. But he said something. There was that, if you like, a word of knowledge although the Lord had more acts to that than we did. But, you know, he, he said something and it spoke powerfully and it changed something in her. And the Lord, through the Spirit, gives us gifts and miracles. In Acts 13, we have a situation where there's a magician who is before the, one of the, the government officials, the proconsuls. Paul is trying to preach to them. And this magician is trying to turn them away. But Paul speaks powerfully by the Spirit and brings on temporary blindness on this magician. And Sergius, this proconsul, sees it and turns to the Lord. A spiritual battle, a spiritual weapon. And as a result, there is a spiritual change. Not just he, but others came to know the Lord. If Paul had acted in the flesh and tried to come up with arguments about why this magician was wrong, well, he probably wouldn't have got very far. But the Spirit gave him the enabling to act in a powerful way. I thought of the word of our testimony in Revelation 
You know, one way they, the people in Revelation, the believers, overcame the enemy was through the word of their testimony. It's not enough on its own, of course, but that's a powerful thing. And we can share it with others as well and say, look what the Lord has done. We saw in Eric Liddell last week in the DVD, we saw how he uh, left his whole career behind. He was an Olympic champion. He could have gone further. But he left everything and went to China. How powerfully that testimony spoke to people. It must have done. It must have worked to change in some. And on that matter, really our conduct, I don't know if I'd describe our conduct as a weapon. But of course it does talk about our weapons of righteousness. And our daily conduct, if we are changed by the Lord and we live in a certain way, that speaks powerfully to people. Maybe it can achieve more than we in our fleshly wisdom could ever achieve as people see a change. And so I just mentioned these as uh, possibilities. The main, most important weapon is that word of the Spirit. But let's remember we are not unequipped friends. We have been given everything that we need for these battles. And so finally, let's just address what these battles were for. Because it says it's for the destruction of fortresses or strongholds. What were these strongholds? And certainly in some prayer circles, uh, obviously understandably, people sometimes talk about these spiritual strongholds. For example, they might talk about Islam, uh, as just to pick out one example. And they, they think about the spiritual powers and the fact that we need to pray against them, and that's absolutely right. But here, Paul is talking about speculations. Uh, and he talks about taking every thought captive, as well as things lifted up against the knowledge of God. With these spiritual weapons, Paul's practice and others' practice was to pull down these strongholds, these speculations, these thoughts, these arguments. And of course, the sword of the Spirit is great for that. Because against the flesh, the arguments of the world, we can bring the Spirit's powerful words. Uh, to bear on the situation. You know, Paul would have been surrounded in that day by idols, by temples. There was so much lifted up against the knowledge of God, besides Greek thinking and other things that were coming into the church. There were these idols. Everywhere were things lifted up against the knowledge of God. And yet we see how in Acts, in that sermon at Athens, as I'm sure we did elsewhere, Paul sought to bring the truth, to pull down those strongholds of the, uh, the idols, the futile thinking of the world, and to bring God's truth. And I wonder, what strongholds, therefore, do we face today? I've mentioned the spiritual strongholds that, you know, that might be at work in the government. I've mentioned Islam, for example. Evolution is a powerful thing lifted up against the knowledge of God and everything that goes with it and humanism. All of these ways of thinking that says there's no God. You know, it's just all about us. But we're called as much as possible with the Lord's help as he leads us to bring down those strongholds. Okay, we can't bring them down completely. But to do what we can in people's lives to share the truth and to replace those strongholds of the enemy with the things of the truth. The Lord's weapons are still mighty. The Lord's arm is not shortened. Let's not limit the Lord by our experiences. As we go forward as a church this week, this month, this year, let's not limit the Lord. Let's not say just because of the way it's been in the past that it's going to be that way in the future. Let's go forth in the Lord's strength. And for us individuals to do the same. And not just in others, but in our own lives, to take thoughts captive that are not obedient to the Lord. There's so much I could say, but time is gone. Let's ask the Lord to help us, whether or not I've interpreted this fully correctly, whether I've given every example or not. The Lord can do that. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you. We've considered the matter of the word that is that sword and of the Spirit, and we do ask, Lord, that you would give us that understanding afresh of what we considered this morning. Thank you, Lord. It's not up to me. It's not up to any of us, Lord. It's up to 
your spirit, Lord, to illumine things ultimately, Lord. And so we again uh, uh, put ourselves before you and pray you'd open our eyes. Would you expand our horizons where we can limit you? Would you show us any way in which we're thinking according to the flesh? Would you open our eyes to the spiritual battles around us? <clears throat> and Lord, please may it lead us to be more effective. May it lead us to using the weapons you've given us in the right way. Yes, deliver us from excess. Deliver us from taking things the wrong way. Deliver us from abusing what you've given us, Lord. But Father, please, Lord, may we not uh, leave down the weapons you've called, called us to pick up. Guide us in how to use them and make us to be victorious afresh, Lord. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.